word. Father, thank you so much um, for just bad ideas, Lord. I mean, if you were to ask me if sending your son into the world to live amongst us and then to die in our place, I would have told you that's a bad idea. If you were to tell me, Father, that through the power of the resurrection and the resurrection alone that you were going to draw men and women and boys and girls to your name and that we would have nothing to do with it besides respond in faith, I, I probably would have said that's a bad idea. God, if, if, if I were to know the story of my own life and how you were to save me and, and, then, and then just the weakness and the frailness that I'm equipped with and you're going to put me in some of these places, I, I probably would have said that's it's probably a bad idea. But God, you love bad ideas. You're like the God of bad ideas. And you're, you're the God of the third way. You're the God of the unseen. So we are beginning to expect great things from you and attempt great things for you. Thank you for William Carey, who taught us about that last week, Baptist missionary, and thank you for your Holy Spirit that inspires us to, to try new things. Help us now as we talk about joy. Would you fill us with it? and bring life through it in Christ's name. Amen. 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 All right. So listen, I feel, yeah, yeah, let's, let's we're just going to pivot right now to something deeply important like peppermint bark. <laughs> so here's the deal. You want to talk about joy, inexpressible joy. I feel like it all comes down to peppermint bark. Okay, and now this isn't any peppermint bark. Where is this peppermint bark from? <laughs> yeah, some of you guys roll in the, in the like, um, I, well, I don't know where my wife got it. It says Williams Sonoma, so um, we don't like, we don't roll in there too often. But for this, it's like, yeah, let's do that. <laughs> let's for sure do that. Um, so she brought this home, um, th this, I forget what day it was, but um, like, as you can tell, it's like the, it's like the empty tomb. <laughs> it's awesome, okay? No, nothing in there. And um, here's the thing with peppermint bark. Just think about peppermint bark and joy. I, like, I, I, I definitely experience some, like, joyful moments while I'm, while I'm mashing on, on peppermint bark. But the problem I find with peppermint bark is when I go to peppermint bark and I'm hungry, it never usually ends up good. If I go to peppermint bark and I'm already filled with my dinner and I'm like, oh, this is a nice after dinner treat. It's got a little minty, a little chocolatey. Oh, this is really good. I'm able to break off a piece of the peppermint bark and move on with my night. But if I go to peppermint bark um, and it's like 5 p.m. and uh, you know, I don't know what's for dinner and like things are coming, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start off breaking off pieces of peppermint bark. And then before you know it, um, I will have eaten like whole slabs of peppermint bark. And at the moment, I'm going to say, this is good, this is good, this is good. This is actually filling a need. I'm beginning to feel satisfied. But then at 8 p.m., I'm going to be like, oh my goodness, what happened? I don't, I don't know why I did that again. I know. I know what happens with peppermint bark. I know what happens with the Chicago mix from the popcorn house. I know what happens when I start like nibbling on things that are meant to be nibbled on and yet I use them for like my complete satisfaction. I feel like a lot of times that may be where we are as it pertains to joy. We look to things that are meant to be enjoyed as small gifts that remind us of the giver, but we begin consuming them to the degree that they satisfy us for a moment, but then they always leave us like bent over, wondering why we did that and how are we gonna recover again? Scripture would call them idols. We'll just call them peppermint bark today. Is it possible that we're longing for the wrong thing. Well, we're going to read today from a guy named Peter. If you have your Bibles, we're going to be in 1 Peter. And he knew a bit about longing. Um, C.S. Lewis tells us in his book, Surprised by Joy, all joy reminds. It is never a possession, always a desire for something longer ago or further away or still about to be. Isn't that a cool idea of joy? 
that it's, it's actually, joy is actually connected with something that's about to be. Have you ever thought about like why Christmas Eve is a lot of times like way better than Christmas morning? It's like, oh, I can't, it's almost, I mean, go back to your kid days. It's, and then Christmas morning happened, Christmas morning's cool, but it was like the buildup is where the joy was. And so maybe, maybe C.S. Lewis is onto something that, that joy is actually wrapped up in what's about to be rather than, than a possession for us to consume right now. So the scripture we're going to be looking at today talks about inexpressible joy, a joy that goes beyond words, a joy that like, you know, um, if, if you were to get me mid-bike of my peppermint bark, I might be like, mm, uh, mm, mm, hold on, mm, mm. Like, like I don't even have words to describe what I'm experiencing right now. And scriptures are going to talk about that type of joy that, that really goes deep down into our soul. See, the thing is um, longings. That's where we're going to kind of be, be working, working from today. Longings aren't bad. You, because you're created in God's image, are actually created to long for things. I long to be a good father. You may long to be a successful um, career person. You may long for sobriety. You may long for um, companionship. Uh, you might long for um, the, the flourishing of your neighborhood. You might long for your kids. All those things are good. Like, you are actually created to long. It's part of uh, us being created in God's image. And so this message isn't about um, don't long, don't have desires. Don't. This message is just about, I wonder if your desires are enough and if they're like directed at the right thing. So First Peter is going to help us with that. Uh, and we're going to read the passage together. And, and I find this passage to be, um, you know, uh, like, I feel like God might do something, potentially, in just the reading of his word. So, so would you stand with me as we read this passage together? And um, It's so rich that if you don't have a Bible, just make sure your eyes come up to the screens and, and follow along. And uh, Our author is Peter. Peter is one who would be an Advent guy. He would be one who was no longer with Jesus. Jesus has left the scene recently. Peter had something to do with that, actually. And he's promised that Jesus is going to come back. And so if you want to talk about a guy who understands Advent, both looking back to Jesus' first coming and really looking forward to his second and trying to find joy somewhere in there, he's your guy. And this is what he says. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Amen. You may be seated. Hey, so um, we're going to work our way through this, uh, through this passage here. You have an outline that's going to have a few blanks that kind of keep you engaged, um, if, if that's your thing. And so you're, I'll be, be sure to give you those, uh, those blanks um, passage breaks down into kind of two themes here. Um, the first one is, I, I feel like, incredibly important to joy. If we're going to be uh, like a people of joy, we would have to first and foremost know that we're safe. We're safe. You are safe. Those of you in Christ, now listen, I'm going to talk to you about a couple of promises today, and they're not universal promises. They're not for everyone. 
they are for those who are in Christ. And what it means to be in Christ is simply that you've come to the end of yourself, you realize yourself to be a sinner, that God's holy, just, and righteous, and that he should and will punish you for eternity because that's what righteous judges do because of the way your heart has broken his law. But that same God filled with mercy, as the passage talks about, decided to pour out his wrath on Jesus instead of you. And Jesus died in your place on the cross with your sin personally attached to him. And on the third day, when he had finished being crushed in your place, he rose from the dead. And he offered people like me and people like you the opportunity to turn from ourself, to turn from our sin, to turn from like our best intentions and simply say, Jesus, you are enough. I commit, I surrender, I trust you. I wanna follow you. You come to him in faith in that way and these promises are yours. Let's look at, at two really today. And the first one is, is you, you are safe. I mean, doesn't it feel really good to be safe? I wonder how much of our life we spend trying to get safe. I mean, we could go through the, we could go through the list of, of things that you have in place to keep both you and your family safe, whether it be um, armor or, or, or like uh, an alarm or a dog or where you live or a gate or like a guard house or whatever the case may be, like safety is a really big deal. I don't know if we would be here necessarily in mass if you thought your safety was gonna be compromised. Maybe we'd be here in more mass here in America. I don't know, where you see the church blowing up, safety's not always guaranteed, but you see the gospel spreading like crazy. So it could, it could work in reverse, I don't know, but we know that, that safety is really a big issue. And so the first sort of thing that we have to understand is that you, you don't get safety on your own, you're actually born again into it. You were born unsafe. You were born in your sin, you were born apart from God. God created you and you're still in his image, but, but you were born under the wrath of God, rightfully so, as was I. And until Jesus worked the miraculous work of faith and repentance in your, in your life, you were living unsafe. And when people feel unsafe, they do crazy stuff. That's the world around us. That's why, that's why my tolerance for what I see in the world is pretty wide because of course, I, when I feel unsafe, I act crazy. So we're living in a place of where people just feel themselves to be unsafe, although they don't know how to, to name it. And so they live crazy. I have grace and compassion for that. Because I know, as somebody who struggles with fear, what it is to live out of a place of, of unsafety. And so, uh, so the first thing that you need to know in Christ is that you are safe. And, and what exactly is safe about you? Well, there's three words here in this passage that are, that are critical for us. Kept, guarded, in God's power. Um, the first thing that you should understand here in this passage, if you have your scriptures, it's, it's going to be right there in, in, in the, the, first, um, the first couple of verses here of, of kept. And uh, I'll just, I have these words circled here if you're, if you're taking note. Um, it's talking about your inheritance. And it's uh, in verse 4, beginning in verse 4. You're going to start to see some of these things come out. You're kept, you're guarded, and you're safe. So the first thing that's kept, you have to understand, is your inheritance. What's your inheritance? In the Old Testament, they were looking forward to an inheritance of land. It was called the promised land. And they, they were told that because of no like, merit on their own, they were going to receive this land that was flowing with milk and honey. It was going to be awesome. They were going to experience peace. And so God was already working his grace in the Old Testament, but that wasn't going to be the ultimate safety because eventually they would like, lose that land. It actually pointed to something they would receive and you and I would receive in the New Testament as our eternal inheritance, which is what we know as our salvation or the fact that we're forgiven in Christ and guaranteed to be with him in paradise for eternity. That is the ultimate salvation. That is your ultimate inheritance. And so um, as we, as we kind of look through this, it's like, man, when it comes to things that are important to you, you usually want to keep them in a place that's really safe. Like you don't normally put your kids on 95 and say, go have fun, right? Like go play, try to stay in the right lane because there's slower people over there, but here's a couple of balls. Here's, like just go have some fun. No, no, no. You put your kids and you double buckle them into their, into their like car seat. You put them in schools that you believe are safe. You, Whatever it is that's like an extension of you that's really important, you do everything in your power to keep safe. There's nothing more important 
than the fact that you've been given eternity with Jesus. The person of Jesus is your greatest treasure. And I have good news for you. You can't mess it up. In Christ, you can't lose it. You don't have to keep it. It won't tarnish. It won't fade. It won't lead you doubled over wondering why you did this again. It is God himself, your connection to him both now and forever, and it is kept for you. The word used for kept is to guard. There's going to be two words here that, that have a similar meaning, but some different application. To guard means um, that somebody is keeping an eye on it so that it won't fade, so that it won't tarnish, so that it won't, it won't um, wither away. Um, as it pertains to kind of like what's happening right now in your salvation, it's critical that you know that no matter how you're doing, no matter how your week was, no matter how you're advancing through the things that you're being held accountable for, it's kept for you and it's safe. For some of you, that's absolutely freeing and thrilling. For others of you, that's terrifying because you've always been the responsible one. You've always been the one who held the keys You've always been the one who took care of the details. When you had good days, we called you responsible and oftentimes mom. When you had bad days, it might have gone to, ooh, kind of acting like a control freak right now. But for some of us, to think about not being in control of the thing that's most important in our lives can be terrifying. And you don't live with joy because you're trying to keep and maintain and not allow things to tarnish what's not yours to keep. There's another thing in this passage um, that, that goes into your safety and it has to do with you being guarded, you being guarded personally. So your inheritance is kept, but the other word here that you use is, is actually translated guarded, but it's more of a military guard. And what I love about this is this is a, this is a guard that keeps enemies from coming in and at the same time would keep people from going out. I love that. I know about my enemies. Do you guys know about your enemies? Your enemies, is not, it's not like the government, it's not like the IRS, it's not like your, your nasty boss, okay? So, I mean, they, they may have like forms of, of like enemy territory to you, but, but like you have an enemy. Your, your enemy is, the scripture says, he, he has his name, his name is Satan, and there are demonic forces that hate the fact that you're here right now, the fact that your children are here and being um, discipled by women like Susan and her husband. There is an enemy that hates that you are making progress and would love for you to remain apathetic about your spiritual growth. You have an enemy who's extremely powerful. You have an enemy called yourself as well. It's the flesh. And your flesh, every time you want to take a step of obedience over here, your flesh is like, don't do that. That's a bad idea. Let's keep living over here where it's way more comfortable and we can afford things. You also do have an enemy called the world in general, where the world is moving one way and beckoning you to follow that. So the cool part about having enemies like that is that the scripture says we're guarded. And we're not guarded by our own power. We're guarded by the, the, the word is God's explode, like it's explosive power. God's explosive power, his character, his nature actually guards you against those enemies. No matter how you feel, no matter how you're experiencing some of the defeat that you might be experiencing right now, you are guarded by the power, the explosive dunamis power of God. Personally. Not like, oh, God's got us. No, no, God has you, Susie. God has you, Kelly. His power, his nature guards you from those enemies. But there's a second meaning to this word, which I love because I'm really fast and I'm so good at running. The second meaning of this word guarded is not just being guarded from outside enemies, but it's guarding the people inside the fortress from running out. Left to my own devices, I will leave the God of the gospel like every time. 
and try to be my own savior or try to look to one of you to be my savior. I will always choose to leave faith and grace and Christ alone. That's just the posture of my heart. But the cool part about it is in Christ, I'm guarded not only from Satan and my flesh and the outside world, I'm actually guarded from my heart that is prone to wander. Because I wanna go, even though I know all that I know. I'm safe because I'm kept. I'm safe because I'm guarded. And I'm safe because it's God's power that does it. I want to, I want to read a sentence to you that goes, goes like this. Um, you could not possibly be any safer than you are right now in Christ. I, I, don't, I don't know about you. I, like, for me, when I write stuff down, it kind of goes a little bit deeper. I left a blank there for you. I mean, some of you just need to write that whole sentence down or at least that one word and circle it and just begin to ask God to make this more and more of a reality in your life. Because if you want joy, it's really hard to be joyful when you're petrified. I don't know of a lot of people who are at like gunpoint who are like super joyful. When you're always threatened and you're always on the run and you always think it depends on you, no wonder we live these like five on the Joy Richter scale lives. I mean, until you get to this point where you understand that you couldn't be any safer than you are right now in Christ, you're not gonna experience this inexpressible joy. You can't do any more to get any safer. Should you pursue Christ? Should you put your sin to death? Should you pray and read your Bible and fast and serve and give? Yes, but not to earn your safety because you are radically safe. And if God is for you, who can be against you? It's okay to talk back to me. It's okay if you are sensing, like, that's where you are. Like, hey, that's good. That's where I am. We, we, can, we can get a little audible up in here. I know we got the candles. It's kind of traditional. But it would be kind of cool to know that I'm not the only person who's preaching this message like his life depends on it. That would be cool. Okay. I want to tell you a second thing that's happening right now. You are obtaining. You are obtaining. What are you obtaining? You're obtaining the outcome of your faith and the salvation that belongs to you. Talk about this here for, for just a minute. Um, what, are you, what are you obtaining? Well, you're obtaining what is, is promised to you, and it's, it's called the, the, um, the outcome of your faith. It's your salvation. It's, this, it's your inheritance. You have it now. Your inheritance, if I were to sum it up in, in just a short phrase, is, is the person of God. Like, you get the person of God, both now and forevermore. The scripture says that eternal life is defined by knowing God. And through Christ, these are promises that you actually begin to experience right now. So you are already have been beginning to obtain your inheritance, but there's one day where you will obtain that inheritance without any sin or suffering or shame. And you will be in a place to fully absorb and behold the radical beauty of Christ, and it'll just wreck you in such a good way. You're, you're actually getting that right now in, in pieces and in bits, and one day you'll receive that wholly. You're also obtaining your salvation. The word salvation means that you've been saved from one thing to another. You've been saved from the wrath of God. You've been saved from the penalty of your sin. You've been saved from purpose, purposelessness and a meaningless life. You've been saved from eternity apart from God. You've been saved from a bunch of junk. Okay, and sometimes we don't remember that. And when we think, man, this is just like another Christmas season, like yay, baby Jesus, and we forget that we were under the penalty and the punishment of sin and the power of sin used to own your life and you used to bow down to your peppermint bark, but no longer, it calls your name every now and then, but no longer do you bow to your peppermint bark. You've been set free. You gotta remember that, people. 
I shouldn't go to church before I come here. I know, I get a little fired. I went to church this morning at 7.30 a.m. <laughs> Praise and Worship City Church got me fired up. I'm sorry. <laughs> Pastor Kelsey, what's he doing to me over there? Hey, so there's some activating elements in this that you may or may not like. Let's talk about those for a minute. Um, the activating element in your protection is your faith. What activates you getting protected and kept and by God's power is faith. Um, it's, it doesn't just happen. The thing that opens that door is faith. And so if you wanna pray for something, pray for an increase of faith. Lord, increase, I believe, help my unbelief. Because as you believe, that's why we talk about why it's so much more important to not just focus on your behavior, but to focus what are you believing about Jesus that's, that's motivating those behaviors. Because as you grow in your faith, so too will you grow in your experience of your safety and thus your joy. The activating person in all of this is Jesus. It's not you. You're a secondary character. You're not the star, but you, you, are, you are playing a part. The activating character in this is Jesus, and it all depends on his promises. So if, if we can rely on his character, if we can rely on an empty grave, then we can rely on the fact that even though you walk through various trials, which we're gonna talk about here in just a minute, it's, it's for your joy and his glory. The activating activity, and this is where passage kinda like leads us out to the end, the activating activity in all this is various trials. It's various trials. All right, so stay with me here. If, if, so, so this is for people who've been born again into Christ through faith and repentance, and um, they're safe and they're obtaining, but there are a few things that activate that so that you experience it more than you're probably experiencing it right now. The first thing that activates that is faith, by believing that God is good in the midst of fill in the blank, by believing that Christ is enough, by believing that Jesus is your better peppermint bark. Like when, you, when, you, when you have faith that walks out in front, you start to experience safety, you start to experience what you're already obtaining right now. The activating person, even in your faith, I love this, because I'm like, oh man, now it depends back on me. I gotta have faith, I gotta have faith. No, check this out. The person who's actually giving you the faith is Jesus, so just keep asking him. He's good for it, trust me. And it's his power that's keeping you. So you can relax. You don't need to gaze at your navel and say, like, like get super consumed at, like, what's my faith been like? How's my, how about, no, no, no. It's faith that activates it. So if you're not experiencing it or you're walking through it, you're, you get confused, you get a little bit chaotic, that's okay. Ask yourself, what am I believing about Jesus right now? And then if you find an area where, like, man, I'm not really believing in his greatness or I'm not really believing that he's my good, I've been looking elsewhere, Repentance is, is turning from that and saying, Jesus, I'm sorry. I had like this adulterous affair on you and went over here for a minute. But yo, I'm back. You have my heart. Would you increase my faith that I wouldn't look over there anymore and, and follow you and trust you and come to you? So the activating, per he'll do that. He loves to do that. The activating power and person and all this is faith. But the activating like, um, activity, the thing where you grow and experience this more and more and more, almost like I could say the people who are, the, who are oftentimes the most joyful are the people who also have the greatest list of various trials. The activating activity, you might not have wanted to sign up for this because the scripture says, if necessary, and I know in my life it's necessary, if everything's well and everything's good and everything's awesome, then Jesus is usually option C. He's there, but he's usually not option A or B. But when I'm crippled by fill in the blank, or my child is sick, or my friend has gone back out into his addiction, or I'm back in my mind, whatever, and all I have is Jesus, oh, then I'm reminded of who my true joy, where my true treasure is, and what's actually coming. And joy surprises me again and again, and again. The activating activity are trials that grieve. I love what David Guzik writes about this. Our faith isn't tested because, because in this passage it says that your faith is gonna be tested like gold. Check this out, because this was always something that I was kind of confused about. Like, are you testing? Like, what, what's the testing all about? He says, our faith isn't tested because God doesn't know how much or what kind of faith we have. It's not like God was curious and didn't know. God's all-knowing. It's tested because we 
often are ignorant of how much or what kind of faith we have. God's purpose in testing is to display the enduring quality of our faith. So like the testing of our faith is actually for you to realize you actually believe this maybe more than you thought. Or maybe you don't believe this like you thought, so get on your knees and ask God for an increase in faith. But the testing of your faith, the various trials, man, that's God's gift to you to expose the fact that, you know what, I really am in. I really do believe this. I really am walking in faith, not perfectly, but thank you, Lord, for what is mine and what's to come. Or, God, I want more of you. Help me in my unbelief. See, God is giving you the activating element of faith through these various trials. He's the person who maintains you throughout the trial. And then it's always about him. It's always about him. You could not possibly be obtaining, check this out, anything better than what you are right now in Christ anything better. You could not possibly be obtaining anything better than what you are right now in Christ. So what Jesus is giving you in your loneliness is better than what you could have with a companion. What Jesus is giving you in your struggle is better than what you could have right now than in your perfection. What Jesus is giving you in your cancer is better right now than what you could have in your full healing. Because in some way, mysteriously beyond my understanding, he's giving you an expression of himself that is far greater than your temporary health and healing. That's super easy for me to say right now where I have no cancer diagnosis, where my kids are healthy where I still have a job. I understand that. Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. It is true that what he's giving you is greater than oftentimes what our heart is longing for. So what's our response to this? Joy that is inexpressible. The scripture says here in this passage, you believe in him and you rejoice with a joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. It's actually only here the the, the term inexpressible joy is used in the whole New Testament. It's the only place you're going to find it in the whole New Testament. It's like there's such a special nature to what your various trials are producing. Now, if you're experiencing your various trials because they're out of your control, this is probably easy to believe or easier to believe than if you're experiencing various trials because you keep on sinning and you keep on choosing your sin. But you know, if you're in Christ, the same is true. Whether, whether the trial is coming completely outside of you or you're volunteering like for slavery, the same is true. You're, what God is trying to do through your pain, through your, through your discomfort, through, through the things that are gripping you, he's trying to release your grip on this so that he can give you more of himself, which will result in joy that you don't even know how to talk about. I get up here and try to tell you this. I get up here and try to be the person who talks about things that are not talkable. I don't even know if that's a word, talkable. But you know what I'm saying? Like here I am, I stand and I'm like, okay, go on, go talk about inexpressible. Go talk about something that's inexpressible. So I am just like, I gotta beg God's spirit to be the one who takes these super feeble words and just, mm, because if I would, dude, I would, I, would, I would give it to you. I would give it to what, I'd give you what I have. I would give you what I want. I would give it to you. But I'm trusting that God is bringing his Holy Spirit to do that very thing. So kind of the last question I have is really, is that, is that true for you? Are you really experiencing inexpressible joy? I think if we were to go back to the passage and we were to see the author of the passage, his name is Peter, there's two types of things that you could identify with. Peter understood loss because he was directly connected to the loss of Jesus to this world. In a real physical, temporal way, 
It was Peter who denied Jesus that then led to his trial and crucifixion, things like that. If you're here today and you, brought, you have loss that's connected to you, this is gonna be maybe your first Christmas without dad, without mom. You have a child that's lost. You've lost your job, you've lost your health. Peter's your Advent guy. You have to understand um, that maybe, maybe you need to increase your longing. I believe God brought you in here today quite possibly to hear, like just inc increase your longing. In the midst of that loss, may I encourage you gently and lovingly to increase your longing and begin looking for God in his departation of his, of his very self to you rather than the comfort that may come temporarily. You know, Peter understood loneliness as well. I know this is a season where loneliness and loss get amplified, but how lonely to be the guy <laughs> that knew what he knew about Jesus and was like, no, I don't know that guy. Never seen that guy. Some of you know about loneliness, man. You just know it's you got horizontal loneliness, friends, family, maybe not around, wife, girlfriend, boyfriend, whatever, kids. You just, you understand loneliness. Some of you understand the darkness of the soul between you and God. Like you know God, but you feel lonely from God. I wanna tell you, increase your longing. Just this week, increase your longing. Count it a joy that God in some way and in some fashion is giving you himself in the midst of your loneliness. And man, make it about Jesus. Make it about Jesus, your longing. Make it about Jesus. I'm hurting, I'm grieving, I'm in pain, Father. Would you show me Jesus? I'm looking for Jesus. I'm in I don't just want something temporary right now, God. I'm gonna by faith walk out in what this guy was talking about here and what Peter's inviting me to. I'm gonna by faith for just a week even increase my longing. I'm gonna posture up and start looking more towards you than what I can experience here in these temporary comforts, even though they may be good. And, and Father, would you, would you show me, would you give me more of Jesus in my loss, in my loneliness? And never forget. Never forget. how someone we deeply respect and look to around here and his words and his thoughts explains it. This is where we'll end. May these words go with you. Tim Keller writes, on the day of the Lord, the day that God makes everything right, the day that everything sad comes untrue, on that day, the same thing will happen to you, to your own hurts and sadness. You will find that the worst things that have ever happened to you in the end will only enhance your eternal delight. Hold on. I promise you, with all that I am, if you know me, dude, if you know anything about me, you have to understand this is coming true. It is coming true for those of you in Christ. There is coming a day where everything sad that you have experienced or allowed other people to experience, God, by the finger of Christ, will individually touch and transform, and you will actually have joy because you experienced that no matter how painful it was today. That's the promise of the gospel, that God turns everything upside down, your chronic pain, your cancer, your addiction, your family dysfunction. He doesn't end there. On that day, all of it will be turned inside out and you will know joy beyond the walls of the world. The joy of your glory 
will be that much greater for every scar you bear. So live in light of the resurrection and renewal of this world and of yourself in a glorious, never-ending, joyful dance of grace. Let's stand for prayer. I'm going to ask our prayer partners to come down and and some of you just need to get prayed up. You need the body of Christ to put a hand on you and pray this reality into you. Some of you need to come to Jesus for the first time to begin to experience this type of joy that is only for those who are born again into it. If you want that, man, both of you, the, the, the joy deficient and the Jesus deficient, you're welcome now is your moment. Don't waste another day. Come on down, we'll have some music playing for you and keep this moment going. Receive the benediction with your hands surrendered, if, if you will. Now may the God of joy, the God of hope, and the God of peace increase your experience of what you are obtaining both now and forevermore, though various trials for a little while may be necessary. May he lift your eyes and encourage your heart that we are a people of joy because he is our great, great treasure. Amen and amen and amen. Love you guys. Thank you.